Let's get ready to rumble! Are you going to put in like a proper recording over that when when you do this, make it all professional, right? Yeah, yeah maybe, or I might just leave that one. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, and welcome to episode three of Boxing Unwrapped. I'm Ryan. And I'm Andrew. And this week, our topic is... What the F is a weight class? It certainly is, and we're going to delve into it in great detail, isn't that right? Oh, excellent detail. If you want to know about weight classes, you are in the right place. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and um, uh, weight class is a really important topic, but I think uh, we were going to kind of go over a little bit from last week. Uh, with a new little segment that we'd like to call What the F Went Wrong Last Week. Yeah, I, <laughs> we'll trial it. This is a pilot for the <laughs> section for the third episode to see if it comes back. But it's a, a can we call it a sectionette? Is that a word? If I just <laughs> sectionette. Well, our new sectionette. Welcome sectionette. to our new sectionette. Maybe not a full-blown section, but a sectionette, shall we say. So I was thinking about this, and uh, if we have a section, what the F went wrong last week, I think there's three good reasons to do this section it, right? Uh, okay, all right. <laughs> You're convinced, I can tell. I'm, I'm convinced now. Okay, yeah. number one, in the spirit of continuous improvement, it's good to reflect back on, on what went wrong. Yes, definitely. Number two, Always. to further emphasize our differentiator as guys who know not that much about boxing, trying to teach people about boxing. It, well, I agree. And I, I think this agree will with that. certainly emphasise our unique selling point in that regard. <laughs> <laughs> and I also thought, from a more pragmatic point of view, it might at least try and postpone the inevitable legal action that will get taken against us one day, as long as we carry on doing this pod. Excellent. I like it. So I like so it. So I think I think those are sort of reasonable reasons to do. What do you reckon? I, I definitely agree. Okay. I definitely agree. Okay, so um, I think given that uh, that I'm speaking, it's only fair that I'll go first with my bloopers. Bl- bloopers okay. is harsh. Let's not call them bloopers. Let's call them uh, corrections slash qualifications. Right, okay, okay. Um, so I made a terrible mistake regarding Tyson Fury, which I'm going to have to apologise for. No! <laughs> I accused him of failing a drugs test in February of 2014, and I could not have been more wrong. He failed a drugs test in February 2015. (laughs) Um, The other thing that I did was, I think this is to do with being British, but I kept referring to that you you were very kind and that you didn't correct me, but you were saying it wrong throughout the last pod. You kept saying regular, and I kept saying standard WE belt. Oh, right. Which okay. is a bit like, it doesn't really make a huge amount of sense, so I'd like to apologise. So standard doesn't really cut it. should have been regular the entire time. Right, okay, okay. And um, we both sort of spoke about it, but the, the sort of widely regarded as the best pound-for-pound boxer just now, Vasily Lomachenko, uh, we said he'd been beaten twice as an amateur. Yeah. And in fact, he had one sole defeat in 396 wins, which was avenged, avenged not once, but twice during major tournaments. So, sorry, Lomachenko. Keep the lawyers at bay for now, pal. <laughs> yeah, could you imagine? I'm, like, that is definitely a grudge match I do not want to touch. <laughs> <laughs> you would, um, I, yeah, I think I would fancy your chances more against Fury, to be perfectly honest. I, so do I, actually. Uh, that's That's, I mean... That's just a, a given. Like to be honest, I think I'd I'd definitely be able to go more rounds than the last guy for. <laughs> Let's not get into it. Yeah, again. Let's not get into it. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, I, you know what? I think it's I think it's good. Was there any more mistakes? Oh, unfortunately for you, yes, there were a couple. <laughs> were there? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. You um when talking about Anthony Josh's epic super fight versus Klitschko, you actually brought Vladimir's brother Vitaly out of retirement for that one. <laughs> <laughs> do you know I didn't even notice I think it was obviously just uh, like a slip of the tongue thing but for for, yeah. um, for accuracy we probably should correct it <laughs> yeah yeah definitely, um, definitely you also shaved three inches off Tony Bellew's height 
so you said he was six foot, but he's actually six foot three, which still makes him a small heavyweight, as I've gone on yeah, various points yeah. across various episodes. But he's six foot three, we should point out. Is he six he's foot three? Wow, okay. Well, he's a tall guy. Like. Well, I think you always have to take boxers' official measurements by with a pinch of salt. I don't think they're always mm-hmm. like you know one hundred percent accurate, but I, he he purports to be six foot three. Wow. Okay. So, Very interesting. Um, Very interesting. The other thing, just to clarify, is that when we were speaking yes uh, last weekend uh, about the number one ranked boxer within each of the bodies, that's referring to the number one ranked contender rather than the the belt holder, who's considered as separate to that being the belt holder. Yeah. Okay. That's a good cl- good uh, clarification Thank there. You. I think. Thank you. And there was one more. While not technically an error, you did declare yourself, although it was in jest, as a semi regular champion. Uh, and I'm not sure this is the right form for you to talk about your, you know, daily bell methods. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, that is something I'm definitely a champion, to be honest. <laughs> we've just, we've just I'm crossed the shit. line into over-familiarity with our listeners. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, good. I like it. I like it. <clears throat> well, I think what we should do now is move on to our topic of the week, which is weight classes um, and I think you know it's, it's really important for us to maybe discuss a little bit about why we have weight classes in boxing mm-hmm. uh, to some of our regular listeners um, they'll know that uh, weight classes uh, were introduced um, to make sure that fights were more fair um, you know initially the ancient Greeks they didn't have weight classes which was a problem um, uh, you know, and they just ended up, you know, having big guys win all the time. But, you know, since the introduction of weight classes, it makes fights more fair. Um, it means that people are fighting other people that are roughly the same size as them. Um, you know, unless you're Tyson Fury, who <laughs> tends to fight guys who are a lot smaller. <laughs> in fairness to him, in that regard, there are very few people... If he only fought people the same size, he'd probably have even longer than two and a half years in between fights because they're so rare, really <laughs> walking the face <laughs> no. of the He's just a giant. But, um, it, and this ultimately, uh, you know, by having these weight classes actually makes it safer for boxers because it means that they're fighting someone who's roughly the same size and they're not going to go in there and get absolutely hammered by someone who's twice the size of them. Uh, so it means that it's more of a fair fight. It probably makes uh, it less than... safe for the giant guys who would much <laughs> who would feel more comfortable <laughs> fighting midgets the entire time. Yeah. <laughs> Which is you know what Tyson Fury has <laughs> built his career right. off We've of. We've had to go for two minutes without like, mentioning <laughs> Tyson Fury on this podcast. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right. Starting now. Okay. Starting okay. now. Let's do starting it. now. Starting now. Okay. <laughs> now. Um, uh, there's a difference when it comes to weight classes uh, and the way that it's administered between amateur and professional boxers. Um, with amateurs, they can't actually fall below the lower weight limit in a weight class, mm. whereas you know in a professional uh, fight, professional boxers can actually weigh less than the, the lower limit in the weight class. So, you know, they can go up a weight class and, it, and you know, they can decide to fight that. But be, in the amateur realm, you can't actually do that. Oh, interesting. Um, and I th- yeah, and I think that's, that's, you know, probably just to make it safer at an amateur level as well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, because you, you, you're not a professional fighter, you're, you're gathering up experience and stuff. And I, th- I guess it, it must just be a safety mechanism. Um, so you don't have people fighting like to double their weight class mm-hmm. and you know having their eye sockets collapse on them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Let's <move> so on. <laughs> let's move on. So also sometimes boxers um, can choose to fight at something called which is called a catch weight, um, and this is like a non-standard weight class, and they they agree to fight in roughly a. A certain area. Mm. Now, uh, I'm I'm going to ask you a little pop quiz, Andy. Oh, no. um, right. So, what? Remember, listeners, famous... our, our 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 unique selling point is our lack of boxing knowledge. Carry on, Ryan. <laughs> so, what very big super fight uh, in quite recently 
occurred between two people at a catch weight of 154 pounds. Ah, uh, okay, okay. Was was one of them more famous for doing something other than boxing? They might be, yeah. <laughs> was one of them a rather mouthy Irish lad? He might have been. <laughs> You're, of course, referring to the super fight between Floyd Mayweather, Floyd Money Mayweather, and... Uh, Money Mayweather. Mayweather. You are, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, um, you know, a, a, as a part of the negotiations, obviously, th these guys wouldn't probably have fought, you know, uh, in in a weight class, if they even if they were both boxers or both UFC fighters, because they, they fought, fought at different weights. So in order to make this fight happen, they had to agree on a weight that they had to fight at. Mm -hmm. So that actually was 150 I was going to say, on that point, there's, I guess, because it's, between a potential fight between two British fighters that's going to get a lot of potential uh, coverage if it happened is the Amir mm -hmm. Khan versus Kell Brook fight that's not been arranged but everyone's been talking about for however many years. What, yeah. One of the problems they have now with making that, there, there, are, there are probably going to be a number of problems, but is that Amir Khan, since his comeback, he's fighting at 147, he's fighting at welterweight, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. Kell Brook said... He basically can't make 147, and so he's now yeah. fighting as a super welter at 154, isn't he? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Because he needs the extra, the extra muscle mass around his eye socket. <laughs> yeah. it's actually it's not muscle mass; it's actually cock. <laughs> <laughs> they just filled it in with some filler. Try and keep it in there. <laughs> so um, right, yeah. So uh, yeah, exactly. So you know, if you're if you're gonna have a fight like like that, you know, where it's probably not for a belt necessarily, it's it's a grudge match, or whatever. Mm -hmm. They 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 decide to fight it. So they, they would probably fight for example, at like one fifty or something would be the catch yeah. in between the two divisions because can can't go up to one fifty four. Yeah, because because they can't make they can't make the the right weight. So and it'll be a no, so that's a non standard kind of weight class. We'll go on to kind of how many weight classes there are. Um, so. As you know, our regular listeners will know that the you know there are seventeen weight divisions. There is actually also an uh, a new weight division, um, which is at forty six point two seven kilos, which is atom weight, uh, and that was actually very recently introduced. It was it was only introduced in two thousand and seven, um, but you know it's a that's an extremely lightweight class so it's only seven stone four and it's it's you know quite often you'll, you'll find it in female boxing um because women can can weigh that much because but like i don't even think one of my legs weighs 46 kilos <laughs> I mean, like but it's you know you, you find you find women like if you go on to the you know the the home of most of our our research which is wikipedia and look at uh atom weight you'll see that it's it's mainly uh, women's uh, women's boxing and, and junior amateur boxing uh -huh. where people come in at, at that weight. Honestly, I hadn't ever heard of it. Uh, you you wouldn't have because I mean it's it's just it's it's such a it's such a light weight division um, and not many people fight at that weight unless you're you're a child or like a very small woman. Um, there's also a, a, a kind of semi-recognized weight class which is called super cruiserweight uh, and it was introduced by the IBA but really no one fights at that because you would either be a cruiserweight slash light heavyweight or go into to a heavyweight match it's it, it, there's not really a need for it have you heard the line about cruiserweights what they say about cruiserweights I think this is actually really unfair but I don't know who okay. I don't know who to attribute the line to initially I heard it on a different podcast and this is one of the things that we can do the qualification slash correction in next week's episode if, if that <laughs> section may, remains but yeah. they say cruiserweights are have you heard this cruiserweights are yeah. light heavyweight no sorry cruiserweights are heavyweights with too much fear or light heavy weights with too much beer or maybe the other way around <laughs> that's, the, that's the line so no one should be right. a cruiserweight but I think that's kind of bullshit to be honest like Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're going to talk I mean, about this later but. 
No, I mean, no, I mean, I think that in fact, that, you know, if you're a boxer, you want to fight at your best weight, and if your best weight is cruiserweight, like if you look, a like, really good example would be David Hay, mm-hmm. absolutely phenomenal cruiserweight, you know, um, but not a great heavyweight. You know, he's, Ooh, he's not big enough. Ryan, that's controversial. Not recently a great heavyweight. That's not, not recently. Yeah, not recently. He was a great heavyweight, but I think he's 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 not as imposing a heavyweight as you know in in the kind of standard heavyweight class. You've got guys who are like you know six five, six six, six seven. Mm-hmm. So even if you are coming in at six two, six three, you're you're to- you're losing so much reach, you and you've got to be incredibly mobile to be able to get in and and fight someone who's much taller than you. And be able to get on the inside to, to create damage. Did them, um, and I was just wondering, as a sort mm-hmm. of, I guess, the, an example of the mismatch was he fought, so, you know, he won the, one of the heavyweight, I think it might have been the WBA, but he did win a heavyweight belt when he fought Valuev, who's, I think, I think I'm right in saying seven feet tall, and he mm-hmm. beat him, but it was because mm-hmm. he didn't actually know how to box, and he was just some kind of, like, circus performer who was seven feet no I mean he, he did beat some fighters but he was like incredibly mm-hmm. immobile so he just like yeah. hit him and then ran to the other side of the ring by which time Valiev then they sort of started to like tr- sort of trudge towards him incredibly slowly by which yeah. time he was yeah, on the yeah. other side of the ring <laughs> <laughs> but if people were interested it, was, yeah. it might be like uh, you know you can at least look up the highlights or whatever on, on whichever video streaming service you it, so choose it was it was WBA champion Nikolai Valuev. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so you know, like I mean, it was a, it wasn't a Diddy belt; it was an actual. No, like, no, no, it was belt. a proper. He, he he declared himself as the uh, you know he could declare himself as a heavyweight champion of the world, and I, and he also always banged mm-hmm. on about being, I think, the only man, other than Holyfield, to have, to have won both to be a unified cruiserweight and then win a heavyweight championship. Yeah, like a that. heavyweight. I think it was yeah, yeah. The only ones that have done it. So. That's that's actually right. I don't think we'll have to correct that in next week's episode. <laughs> Are you sense checking me live? No, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> totally are. Um, totally, I'm keeping myself right this time. Um, uh, so in in amateur boxing, there's only fourteen weight classes. Um, so they have slightly less weight classes, but they, you know they've obviously got a bigger catchment range, um, and the best. Weight class name goes to banana weight. <laughs> Are you sure this isn't one of these things where like it's wrong on Wikipedia? No, it's definitely not wrong, man. It's banana weight. It's fifty six kilos. How did they come up with that? I, I guess like I don't know. Maybe that's what a crate of bananas weighs. <laughs> no, you didn't mean that. <laughs> <laughs> Is that including the crate or minus the crate weight itself? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's probably including the crate weight because otherwise it's quite a lot of bananas. Um, <laughs> now, uh, it's, it's one thing that's quite important to um, to point out to you know people who are, are coming to boxing mm-hmm. um, is that uh, as we covered before, there are different sanctioning bodies uh, for boxing. Sometimes these guys actually call their weight classes different. Yes. Uh, different names. So, for example, in the WBO, they don't have a cruiserweight, but they have a junior heavyweight. This uh, is like one of these things that we went on a lot about last week about how mm-hmm. it's almost as if they're trying to drive people away from being interested in the sport by doing just stupid shit. Yeah, and this is, yeah, well, this exactly. is a perfect example of that kind of stuff. It's like it's complication for absolutely no value. Yeah, totally. Like uh, you know, it's it's completely pointless. Um, you know why you couldn't just have the same name across them all. You know, so for example, you know, in some uh, sanctioning bodies, you have a super bantamweight, mm-hmm. but in other sanctioning bodies, it's a junior featherweight. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's just, it's it's a bit ridiculous because actually knowing the weight classes and what they kind of correspond to is difficult enough, uh-huh. let alone 
throwing in different names for the same <laughs> also damn thing. Known as. <laughs> also known as. You know, it's just, it is. It's one of those things, like, if you want to bring people to the sport, why do you have to make it so goddamn complex? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? Uh, it's 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 a bit of a piss take, yeah. and, and I think that sometimes it'll, it, it can put people you off. Have, yeah, you have to know from, like, the original namings what their sequencing is to know that, like, um, a lightweight is heavier than a featherweight to know that then like a s- sort of whatever like a super featherweight and a junior lightweight is effectively the same thing because if you know that they're consecutive classes if you've got a lesser mm-hmm. one of one and, an, and a higher one of the other you know effectively that's the same thing but you'd have to know all of them to then you'd have to be so comfortable with it to know that, that you're never going to be unless you're really into it so it's just it's just muddying the water a hundred percent, you know, which which is what we are trying to clear those waters up. <laughs> <laughs> so just remember, right, the best thing to do is that if you're confused by it, the Wikipedia page is very comprehensive uh, and easily accessible. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can like you can always check yourself on that because actually, you know, I mean, it's, it's little things like even, for example, super middleweight, which is a very popular division. Um, in the IBF, they call it a light cruiserweight, and like uh, you know, they're the only ones that are odd weight, odd ones out on that one. Uh huh. So I just don't understand why they, you can't just get these guys in the room and go, all right, if there's one thing we can unify amongst all of our governing bodies, mm-hmm. we'll decide to call the weight classes the same. Yeah. Like th- I think that would be a great step forward for the sport, actually. Here, here. I think here, maybe here. we should start a campaign. We'll start a campaign. I'm gonna do. A, we should do a petition. We can uh, we can bam up organizations on Twitter. Oh, we can be like it. IBF. Oh. What are you messing about? This light cruiserweight nonsense. It's a super middleweight like everyone else. Top shot would be special. Exactly. Like you know, let's do it. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna tweet them every day this week <laughs> until I get a response. Right, and just get see if I do get a response. I probably won't because. Like, They're too busy they making up fictitious names for weight division <laughs> yeah. to respond to that. Give, giving it away fake belts. <laughs> and, you know. Well, it's it's actually, uh, we're talking about the IBF, right? So they're actually probably like getting bribes for rating fighters. Ooh. Oh, that just happened that one time. We don't have any evidence to suggest it was any other than that one time that we spoke about where there was evidence last week. Nothing else. Thank you. <laughs> Nothing else, thank you. Yeah, because these guys do have a lot of lawyers. <laughs> and we don't have any. We need a lawyer. I have none. Sure. Or do you I think he would be like, you. the lawyer would be like, you can't say that, you can't say that, you definitely can't say that. It would cut them. It would cut it down from an hour to about 15 minutes every week. <laughs> it could be, you know, some people, when they, like, they'll start reading a book, and I'm a bit like this, and even if it's really crap... <clears throat> Like, you don't really want to leave it unfinished. You feel like, you know, you've got that type of personality that you want to get to the end. So I think yeah. maybe people stumble across our podcast and then they're like, you know, it's more painful for them to abandon it than it is to complete it, even though it might be marginal. Are you saying that our podcast is like a crap book? <laughs> I'm not doing any more analogies. I'm just saying, I'm, I'm, I'm floating it as like, you know, a possibility. But no, I'd, I'd like to think it was like a mediocre book. Rather than yeah. a crap book. A, medi- a mediocre book that gets slightly better with each chapter. Mm-hmm. There we go. Uh, so, let's let's move on because we're sidetracking ourselves as per usual. Um, let's talk about how boxers manage their weight for fights. Uh, and this is, a, this is a really important part of boxing, actually, um, is fight camp. Mm-hmm. So, it's usually about 12 weeks uh, before their actual fight and you know there's a lot of things that they do you know they look at who they're fighting and you know they they work on different aspects of their uh, their kind of style in order to maximize it best for their opponent but a lot of it is about making their weight class um, you know so they'll increase their fitness over the 12 weeks so that it gets increasingly harder so that they can do you know, they start out doing one sparring round, they get up to 12, closer to the end of the fight, um, the, you know, closer to the fight, rather. Um, and there was someone who was a very famous British boxer who was famous for making weight 
And sometimes in in a crazy amount. Can you guess who this might be, Andy? Mm, I think I, I'm assuming you're referring to Ricky Hatton. Ricky Fatten, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> so I when I was doing research for this, and it actually it blew my mind, right? That he used to come into camp thirty five to forty pounds over his fight weight. Seen, and he's not like. I mean, I can't. I don't know what weight actually. I know he would have fought at different weights, but he was what? I don't know what weight was he like a lightweight or a welterweight? He wasn't a big guy, is my point. No, he he definitely wasn't um, uh, a big guy. So he uh, start. He was a, a welterweight um, and a light welterweight. Uh, okay, was I was about right. You know, so yeah, so you were right. So like when he fought uh, Mayweather, he fought at, at welterweight. Um, and I think I think he's, he found that that was a bit heavy for him actually. I think he he, he didn't like it. Mm-hmm. But you know he would he, after his fight, as soon as the fight was done, he'd be on the on the pints all the way through until like the day before his next fight. I mean he would gain you'd get like pictures in the sun of him between uh-huh. fights, and he was he just ballooned. absolutely huge ballooned. It was unreal to think that you know he would gain that much weight. I mean, can you think of any other? <laughs> Athlete <laughs> that would gain that much you weight in an off season. This segment, so that you could specifically make reference. I'm not saying his name. Tyson Fury. <laughs> Tyson Fury. Well, I mean, okay, obviously he's gained a lot of weight while he's off, but he doesn't really actually because he's a. And we might it might be useful to to highlight this to our listeners. Is uh, heavyweight fighters don't actually have a, a top. Weight class, they can weigh, weigh as much as they want mm-hmm. when they come into the ring. So he doesn't, act, I mean, you know, in terms of fitness and movement and, and everything, yeah, he needs to, to lose like two and, two, two and a half stone, but he doesn't really have to lose, lose anything if he didn't want to. Um, whereas, you know, Ricky Hatton had to make a defined weight catchment in order to be able to, to fight. Mm-hmm. Um, and, I, I, you know, could you imagine, let's say Sergio Aguero, Right, he's knocked out of the World Cup now, and he goes, "Do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go on the pints <laughs> <laughs> over the next two months. I'm going to gain thirty five to forty pounds before I get back and see good old Pep." It would be funnier. It would know? be funnier if it was Messi that did it, just because he's so <laughs> fucked off with all of his teammates for being shit, and he's just like, "Do you know what I'm just doing? I'm going to eat Big Macs and have pints. I don't give a fuck. I don't care." Exactly, but you, I mean, no other athlete. I mean, you never saw Usain Bolt. Okay, yeah, he'd go and have a bit of a party after the Olympics and stuff, but you never saw him pounded on forty pounds. <laughs> Do you know of what like... I'm wondering about this, and I'm kind of like, the, I understand that like the process of getting down to to weight for boxers is like crippling, um, mm-hmm. for them, and and it's expected that their weight goes back up. But like, I'm not sure whether if there's research to suggest that the kind of like seesawing kind of stuff with the weight is like performance wise a good idea or whether it's just like they should just have a little dip when they're you know going coming towards the fight or but this like crashing weight loss whether or not this is actually like unsustainable or whether it's like suboptimal for performance because i know different fighters have slightly different approaches about it yeah well i mean i think uh anthony joshua has gone down the route now where he doesn't actually really gain too much weight or stay that far away from the gym in between fights mm-hmm. now. So, you know, he's he's usually pretty ripped now most of the time. I think he said in his past he actually used to do the whole thing where he'd, like, not see the gym until he turned up at camp. Mm-hmm. But it, it just didn't really work for him because he'd, he'd have to spend so long getting fit again. See, before you can then focus on the specifics of the opponent, the techniques, your, your boxing style, you're, you're actually just in, in a kind of fat camp for the first part. Totally, totally. So you lose like six or 12 weeks actually get, losing a bunch of weight in order to then get to the point where you learn how to box your opponent, mm-hmm. which I guess really isn't. That optimal at all, if you think I about it. I mean, you know, I think Mayweather was quite famous for for pretty much keeping ticking over in shape. Like, I don't think he ballooned. No, I mean, I couldn't see him do. It. I mean, he was he was quite busy like beating his wives uh, in between <laughs> fights. 
Hold on, hold on. Time check. Right, hold on. I think he got convicted once, didn't he? Did he not? Yeah, he, so, he did get convicted so once. So we can say that he beat, his, he beat one of his wives once, but we can't say any more than that. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so he, <laughs> he beat one of his wives in between fights. Which kept, which potentially, which may or may not have kept him occupied... Yeah, and, kept and it was yeah, it did keep him occupied actually because he did have to do um, community service, uh, house arrest, and community service. Mm. Actually, do you know? I think it's something um, for another episode. But um, there's a lot of boxers that have fairly like checkered outside of ring activities, and it's not just the ones mm-hmm. that you maybe expect. I think this is actually almost a whole pod. In fact, it's definitely a whole podcast worth later down the line. Anyway, let's let's maybe move continue on with our with our actual topic and um uh let's let's talk about like the kind of pinnacle of of the weight class which is the actual way in mm-hmm. um which is if anything a media circus you know i think uh, anyone who even watches anything with sports has seen what a weigh in looks like you got two guys standing in their pants Facing off, it's very it is. Huh? It's extremely homoerotic. <laughs> it is, you know, because like I mean, the, it, and sometimes it's like you know they they pick like the smallest pants. You know, they're like a little bit oiled up, and like you know they're you know they look a bit dead as well because they've had to make this weight, and they're standing in front in front of each other, kind of like flexing and stuff. Um, you know, and sometimes tempers do flare at a weigh in as well. Especially when um, someone cracks know. open a Mars bar. <laughs> <laughs> I want that Mars bar. That's mine. Uh, <laughs> it's mine. But um, in in order to do this, right? It's it's quite it's quite interesting um, because what they tend to do that day or the day before is they dehydrate themselves wildly. Um, you know, so they'll put on these kind of like. Uh, shell suits and like you know sit in saunas and run and do all sorts of stuff to sweat out all the water in their body in order to make weight so actually you know their their weight is a lot lighter a lot lighter than it is normally Mm -hmm. um and they have 24 hours to to make the weight sometimes so you know it they'll they'll you know go stand on the scales if they're still like you know, however many ounces over, then it's, you know, back in the sweatsuit, going out for a run or sitting in a sauna. And like, you know, sometimes you see them at the weigh-in and they do look like really pale mm-hmm. and gone. Uh, on yeah, the brink yeah, of death. Yeah, they're really sick. gone. Like, Because prob- they are, man. I mean, you know, it's, it's actually quite dangerous mm-hmm. in a way, I think, um, in order to do it. And then what they tend to do afterwards is they rehydrate and they can weigh so much more. Like what? How much is it that Saul tainted meat Canelo <laughs> loses for his fight? I, I thought this might come up. No, I think um, so. For his, for the super fight that he had with Gennady Golovkin, the that was a middleweight fight. So the, the weight for the division was a hundred. The weight limit for the division was one hundred and sixty pounds. Yeah, and I think Canelo was. I think it was between one one eighty one eighty five, something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think in comparison, uh, say that was maybe like ten fifteen pounds, say ten pounds more than Golovkin weighed, which is like more than a whole weight class heavier. So they're saying that he was a much bigger bigger man on the night. I, but it's it's insane, and again, you know, I think this idea you know because if you think if you weigh uh, you know stone heavier than the guy mm-hmm. that you're fighting i mean it, it kind of removes the whole point of having a weight class in the first place because you're getting like an advantage over someone else mm-hmm. um and it, it, again it, it's not fair so i feel that this is a very flawed part of of boxing actually is this idea of you know the dehydration rehydration yeah. You know, because it means, A, you don't know actually what the guy weighs on the night, Mm -hmm. which is actually dangerous for for his opponent. And, you know, it it makes no sense. Why can't you have a weigh-in on the morning of the fight? Well, I totally agree. Um, 
it's I think it, it's such a dark art and it's like well I managed to win a world title because not only am I relatively equal to my opponent I am better at losing and regaining water over a 24 hour period and it's just it's just mental that that's like so the, the science behind doing it is somehow mm-hmm. or like your body's facility to cope with it somehow has mm-hmm. a bearing on your likelihood of winning because it, it does because some people that kind of some people have more of a more natural ability to do it than others mm-hmm. without mm-hmm. It, without mm-hmm. depleting them so mm-hmm. i guess there's a couple of things to say so so the IBF, I don't know if you saw this, but that the IBF are the only one who say you have to do a weigh-in on the morning of the fight, of the title fight. So they make mm-hmm. the fighters do that. And on that weigh-in, you can only be a maximum of £10 more than you are on the weigh-in that's 24 hours before the fight. So if you're more than £10 increase between the, the day before and the morning of, then you're no longer eligible for the, for the belt in the fight. But I mean, still ten pounds, right? <laughs> ten pounds is not to be sniffed, especially for the guys it's, where it's like ten pounds is like three weight classes. Exactly. You know, I mean, ten pounds is actually that's is you know that's a lot of of weight. Like, if you were to lose ten pounds, you'd be pretty chuffed with yourself, right? If again, if you I mean, gain you ten pounds, your trousers aren't going to fit. Financially, if I lost ten pounds, <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course you would. <laughs> <laughs> but like you know, like if you if you were to gain ten pounds, there's an there's a good chance your trousers wouldn't fit anymore. So, you know why why do they think that ten pounds is a uh, acceptable amount to gain on the morning of a fight? You know, it's a huge amount of weight. At least it's something though. You know, it, it, yeah, it's it is more towards yeah. a reasonable approach than all the other ones. I I agree with you. It's still like why can't you just Introduce, there's some must be some way to introduce rules to say uh, mm-hmm. you can't weigh more than like X percentage over the actual stated weight for your division to kind of make it yeah. that you don't have these like and you and you get weighed like a few hours before the fight or whatever you can't have it that, that this risky procedure is integral into every weight class opposed to heavyweight it's just madness totally um, you know I think uh, quite a, quite a recent bout was Groves versus Eubank Jr. Mm-hmm. Um, and on the night, Groves weighed like a stone over Chris Eubank Jr. Because Chris Eubank Jr. is not a natural super middleweight. He was weight. at the He's weight more of a middleweight. Like re- uh, dehydrating, wasn't he? He, was, he yeah, didn't have yeah. to do anything to make weight. Whereas Groves yeah, had he to didn't, dehydrate. He had to dehydrate, which me- meant on the night, like you could even see it, like George Groves looked absolutely massive in comparison to Chris Eubank Jr. Mm-hmm. And I think it just kind of removes the, the safety aspect of it all. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, which I think is, uh, is it's not ideal. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I think that they, they really should try and come up with a way of making this uh, better and safer for the fighters. Because actually, you know, you do end up with fighters that like cause themselves real problems dehydrating mm-hmm. and risk death by doing this sort of thing. You know, you have had fighters in the past die through this process. Mm-hmm. It's not good for you. There was um, a recent example with the the British fighter, Jamie McDonnell, who went to Japan to fight Noya Inoue. And I don't know mm-hmm. if you heard about this, but so he fought him and McDonnell was the WBA regular bantamweight champion. Which is a hundred and eighteen mm-hmm. pound limit, and he's five foot ten, and his opponent in New was five foot five. So I mean, it's, it's massively different. But um, apparently, McDonald had such a horrific process, even though it's like managed day by day, stage by stage. He had such a horrific mm-hmm. process making weight that he was actually so physically drained that even when he'd rehydrated for fight night, he wasn't in a condition to compete. So he rehydrated like twenty plus pounds, which is an enormous amount if you oh weigh one hundred and eighteen pounds. <laughs> and he got absolutely destroyed. Anui, for anyone that doesn't know, is like he's another like top ten pound for pound fighter, and he he'd moved up to bantamweight. But I mean, if you saw the fight, McDonald looks like he should be several weight divisions higher up. He doesn't look like he should be in a ring with Anui because he's so much bigger than him. 
but he just gets mm-hmm. destroyed. And they're and they're part of the blame. I don't know whether it's like excuse making or if it's the whole reason or if it's part of it was that he he killed himself to make the weight so badly that he wasn't then fit to fight, and he just gets he got like bowled out of there in one round. That's just it, it's just ridiculous. Mm. But I mean, I think this is uh, you know a good point to to move on to what happens if boxers don't make the weight, mm-hmm. um, because it's it's actually like really frowned upon when boxers don't make the weight. Um, you know, if especially for like title fights and what have you. But um, you know, I think there's been a few cases quite recently where where boxers haven't made the weight for their fight. Um, and you hear all the commentators going, oh, it's just ridiculous, it's disgusting, blah, blah, blah. You know, they have like 12 weeks to make weight. And I think some of it is because actually they're not making weight. They're making roughly enough weight so that they can then cut weight on the day before mm-hmm. so they can then rehydrate. And it does, I guess, it must be some sort of science in order to figure it out yeah, how to totally. make the weight. I'm sure they have all the nutritionists and they'll do like kind of body analysis and various things. I'm sure it's not just like a bloke going, mm, you could probably like lose about 15 pounds of water tomorrow. It'll be, it'll be super scientific now, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, if, if for example, um, a title fight was, was on the line, you know, if, some, if two boxers were fighting for a, for a belt... And someone doesn't make the weight. Most of the time, the fight will still go ahead. They'll still have the fight, but the person who didn't make the weight cannot win the belt mm-hmm. under any circumstances. So what will happen is they'll fight. If the fighter who didn't make the weight wins, the belt actually just then becomes vacant. So the other person loses the belt, but the person who didn't make the weight can never win the belt. If that makes it sense. It does make sense. And they get penalised, dependent on how the contract's been written, they get penalised, don't they, a percentage of the of the purse for not making weight. Or either yeah. a percentage or a fixed fee or if it varies from time to time, but there's a financial penalty for missing the weight. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, it's, it's really frowned upon. But again, I, it, it's such a flawed system anyway um, that, you know, it does happen from time to time, but... Yeah, I mean, you'll you always whenever a boxer doesn't make weight, you, the commentators go absolutely nuts about. Oh, you should be able to make the weight. It's ridiculous. What were they doing? Like, yeah, uh, there was quite a, a famous example, and I'll try and find out who it was for last week. So I can't find it. This guy didn't make it. And he blamed like having a cold or something. Um, uh, I can't remember who it was. Do you know who I'm talking I about? Do, but I can't remember either. Which is was very it, uh, helpful for the purposes of this. Uh, was it was it a super series one? I cannot remember now. The guy, the, the, the super middleweight, one of the guys pulled out because he was sick. But I don't know if it was to do... I don't think it wasn't that he couldn't make the weight. No. It was Bremer, the German guy, I think, pulled out. Yeah, but it, yeah, it, he pulled it, out. And then they, they threw that, like, kickboxer guy in who got his abs- <laughs> his hand... He got, he got his, his ass handed to him by that boy Callum Smith with a big head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I like okay. I like your kind of um, freestyling approach to, to uh, the analysis, but yes, I think that's accurate. Yeah, yeah. I, I, that I hadn't accurate. noticed about his head, but I think everything else was accurately yeah. said. Yeah, <laughs> he's got big hands. <laughs> <laughs> that's surely unfortunate. Surely in, in boxing, you'd much rather have a smaller head and have it less yeah. easily targeted. Yeah, yeah. I don't think natural selection has has kicked in for boxing yet. <laughs> They'll like end up with. <laughs> With basically two dimensional heads. <laughs> yeah, totally just tiny little heads. <laughs> that are like retractable, like a turtle. <laughs> oh, that's great. Right, okay. Uh, is there anything else you'd like to say about weight classes before we move on? The, well, at the risk of sounding a little bit negative, which I'm conscious that we perhaps do at various points throughout the, the podcast, there is. I think I mentioned it before about, you know, like the cruiserweight division being Mm -hmm. quite wide or like they're being slagged off for being a cruiserweight because they should either be a heavyweight or light heavyweight. So going up from the bottom weight divisions, right, this is the number of pounds that each of 
this is the width in, in pounds of each of the weight divisions, if that makes sense. So the, the weight yeah. to, the, to the weight of the next category. So going from the bottom, the number of pounds are for each category. And you'll see if, this, mm-hmm. if there's anything that stands out when I do this. Three pounds, mm-hmm. three pounds, four pounds, three pounds, three pounds, four pounds, four pounds, four pounds, five pounds, five pounds, seven pounds, seven pounds, six pounds, eight pounds, seven pounds, 25 pounds, no limit to pounds. So the, the cruiserweight division is twenty five pounds wide, if you like. Are you? I never really realised that. Yeah, so I didn't either. So um, light heavyweight is up to one hundred and seventy five pounds, mm-hmm. and cruiserweight is up to two hundred pounds, and then over two hundred pounds is a heavyweight. So it's just ridiculous. I think what happened mm-hmm. was they got bored when they were doing the list and they went, well, that'll do it. And like someone else had been like, well, that's 25 pounds. That's a bit wide. That's not really fair. If you're the top or the bottom, that's really, okay, I'll be fine. I'll be fine. What we'll do, right, is we'll make up some funny saying, slagging them all off, and then no one will fight in that division anyway, so it'll be fine. I think that's basically what happened. Oh, my God. So it's just one of these, like, boxing quirks, but to have every other division, the, other, the next widest one is super middleweight, which is... Eight pounds, which is eight pounds wide, if you like, and a cruiserweight is mm-hmm. twenty five pounds wide, three times. It's just, it's just mental that you wouldn't think to subdivide that, because surely there are guys who are like, can only crash their weight to one eighty, and guys that can mm-hmm. crash their weight to two hundred pounds, they're fighting. You know, they've got like a stone and a half disadvantage. It's a massive yeah. disadvantage, even even though they're big guys, it's a huge disadvantage. So that's a kind of absurd quirk. Um, yeah, that I thought might be worth pointing. That's, that is crazy. Mm, I didn't realize until I looked at it again. It's twenty five pounds. Oh, Jesus, mm. that that is pretty pretty mad actually. If you think about it, you know, like it's such a huge cash point. I, I, you should, in many ways, I guess maybe that's why they decided like about this kind of super cruiserweight division because mm-hmm. at least I would break that up. Yeah, I mean, it's you just know? you're gonna have such a natural. Um, like a, a variety in terms of people's sort of natural size within so twenty five pounds is it's nearly two stone it's such a lot if like I say if mm-hmm. you're at the, if you're at the lower end of that versus if you're at the high end of that naturally it's a it's a it's a big disadvantage that you might have yeah another one of boxing's foibles well do you know there there seem to be many <laughs> I th- I think it's because actually and you know this this isn't wholly true but it's kind of run by crooks <laughs> <laughs> I do not think that we mean that to be true no it's not true but it's just not that they're not crooks <laughs> basically <laughs> remember guys right. it's the shit charity shop <laughs> it's the shit charity shop run by Sepplatter it might be okay one day so, uh, I would like to move on to uh, our next new segment, which is Tyson Fury. <laughs> do you like that? I do. That sounded really good. You should be, yeah, you could be doing the, the MCing at like a really low level event next. I probably could. Oh, which would, uh, if this took uh, off, you know, like if we got listeners, then it's actually something that could potentially happen is you would get asked to MC you'd be like a, a kind of special guest celebrity MC like you know special a, guest like a he is a guy provincial town. <laughs> so, exactly like a proper like Z-list celebrity you <laughs> yeah. know like <laughs> yeah because someone who, who was in Big Brother one year pulled out last minute yeah I, I definitely so uh, in this new segment I thought it would be n- good to have just a little bit of time where we talk about the, f- the shortcomings of Tyson Fury because it would help us to ma- maybe not talk about him as much during the podcast or other parts of the podcast um, because there's so much wrong with this guy that actually um, I think he probably does need a little bit of time dedicated to him. <laughs> Is there something, something um, specific you'd like to speak about first? Yeah, what I'd like to speak about first um, is that I wish he would stop trying to 
throw himself in to try and fight Deontay Wilder or Anthony Joshua or whoever when, like, you know, to be honest, he's not fighting any big name for a very, very long time. And, it, and like, if he got into the ring with Deontay Wilder at the moment, he would probably die. <laughs> he wouldn't walk out, would you he? You know? <laughs> he, he definitely wouldn't walk out because, like... He looks like a guy who drives a lorry at the moment, <laughs> not a professional athlete. A guy who drives a lorry who's been going through a really difficult time. <laughs> yeah, totally. Like, he's just had his fifth divorce. <laughs> <laughs> and the lifestyle's finally catching up with him. <laughs> exactly. Like, you know, I just, I don't, I don't get, like, why even Frank Warren, who's his promoter, is even allowing him to open his mouth about this stuff. Because... Like, it would be way too much work for Frank Warren to deal with at the moment to try and line him up with someone who's semi-decent. Because if he loses, and I think this is something that he needs to maybe realize, if Tyson Fury loses a bit against a big name, boom, his career's it's done. It's he's it. nothing. There's no way he's going to go through so, the time and effort to, like, rebuild it after getting pumped. What, of course. So what he needs to do is keep his mouth shut Try and have like try and fight someone who someone might have heard of once, and then come back and like you know go for go for a decent fight in a year, eighteen months, but not now. And if he could just shut up and stop like wearing ridiculous shirts and putting up Instagram <laughs> videos every five minutes, I would really, really appreciate it. Instagram videos. We should point out. So so what he said was that. On behalf of Anthony Joshua, he apologised as his his responsibility because he's British. He apologised for the breakdown in fight negotiations between Wilder and Joshua on his behalf and offered gamely to step into the breach and fight Wilder at his earliest convenience. Is, was that, is that a fair summary? That is a very fair summary, um, yeah. Now, the only problem being with this is that it's a probably not at all representative of what happened and I don't know I don't really want to get in I, well maybe later but I don't know whatever the, the whole thing about who's to blame for the for the negotiations breaking down but I'm sure he doesn't have like an insider scoop on it and there's absolutely no prospect of him fighting within the next like 6-12 months so it's utter bullshit it is total bullshit and you know I think he Tyson Fury just needs to focus on Tyson Fury right now <laughs> and whoever the fuck they're going to have him fight in Belfast well, in August. Well, yeah, because... I was going to... I thought we could do a little bit of um, a little bit of a competition and our listeners okay. can maybe join in as they wish in this one as well. Yeah. So what yeah. I thought we could do would be let's guess the date on which Tyson's Fury August 18th opponent is named given that that's about seven-ish weeks away from now that he's fighting and if he was going to be fighting mm -hmm. someone... Uh, a legitimate big name, they would want a full training cap and they would have named them already. Yeah, 100%. So he's going to fight... 100%. He's, he's, by definition, going to fight a Diddy on August 18th. Yeah, so I am going to think uh, that they are. They will name his opponent on the 1st of August. Oh, I was going to go 1st of August. Because uh, it's such a good guess. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good game. well we'll wait and see do you know what if he does name him then then everyone will be like oh my word they'll be like they'll think that we have insider information and our lack of knowledge is actually some kind of crazy cover for it uh, maybe maybe but if that is the case they haven't been listening to this <laughs> podcast it's a stretch I agree it's a stretch, it um, a stretch. okay I will say I will say one day earlier, I will say they will name his opponent on the 31st of July. And because um, I get to guess second, I will also guess the height of his opponent. And his opponent's height will be six foot three. You're going tall. Wow. You're going tall. I, was, I, I would say six foot. Oh. I think it's six foot because they're like... I think they're probably just running around Belfast boxing gyms looking for a guy who's about six foot tall and isn't that great at boxing. <laughs> Maybe had like a, a few amateur some fights to and cling on, to, like yeah, some 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 like little like soundbitey bit in his in his boxing bio. 
that they can be yeah. like, oh, well, he fought so-and-so, therefore he's not a total diddy, he ain't a total diddy. Do you know, I was... Yeah, d- like, he, he actually, like, I, I think they'll find a guy and they'll be like, oh, yeah, he went to school with Carl <laughs> Frampton. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Okay, right. Do you have anything more to say about this dick for no, this week? I, I, no, I, I don't want to... No. I'm sure he'll give us more material to work with next week. So we can we can park it until I'm sure he will. because you know then Him and isn't, it won't be the end. We know there's going to be lots more. Yeah, it fucking won't be the end, man. It won't be the end. It's just uh, this is only the beginning because make a comeback <laughs> for God's sake. <laughs> right. So let's go into what grinds my gears. You know what really grinds my gears. Uh, so Andy, would you like to tell us what grinds your gears this week? I would, and it's kind of a funny one, right? Because I'm half expecting you, or if there does happen to be any any of our listeners with any kind of boxing knowledge, I know that seems unlikely, they might be able to just automatically correct me or or explain to me why what I'm about to say doesn't make any sense or it's really, really stupid, right? But what I was thinking about was we spoke a bit about like how boxing works and about the scoring in previous episodes, the scoring system. Mm -hmm. Why in professional boxing... Why do they not score round by round in terms of having them displayed? I don't understand why you wait until the end of the fight to then know what the judges' scores are. What would be the the harm or the penalty in saying, as of round six, this fighter has X number of points and this fighter has Y number of points? What would be the reason for not having it work like that? Because, at the very least, even if it's being scored unfairly, at the very least, going into the as the rounds progressed, the fighters would have a clear understanding of whether they can win the fight by carrying on, by changing their strategy, or only by by a knockout win. So at least they would know where they stand with the scoring, even if mm-hmm. they didn't agree with how the scoring was being done. So what would be what would be the harm in doing like that? Why would it not add to the transparency? Oh, the only thing that I could think of off the top of mm-hmm. my head. Uh, would be a, an argument that it could influence other judges' scoring. Mm-hmm. That's the only thing that, <clears throat> that I could think of. However, I, I 100% agree with you. Fighters, you know, sometimes you see the fights and then both fighters will, like, raise their hands aloft in victory and you'll be like, well, one of you's going to look like a right numpty in a minute. <laughs> but at least yeah, you yeah, wouldn't yeah, have yeah. that. Yeah. And, like, if I... I'm not saying... If, I'm just thinking, if I were competing... I would at least want to know where I am. Like, I can't think Mm -hmm. of any other sports. I know I've talked about this before, but I can't think of any other sports where you don't have some form of scoring, like ongoing, where you wait until the end, then go, and the scores for the whole contest were da-da. I agree. And, you know, I mean, I think it'd be quite interesting to, like, for example, watch a tennis match (laughs) where you didn't know... What the score was, and they didn't know what yeah, the score yeah. was until the end. It's like you, you know, know when you play five a side football, and sometimes <laughs> no one can be bothered <laughs> keeping track of the score, and you don't really yeah, know yeah. where you are. Like, are we? I don't know. I mean, are we? Too, we're, we're, too, we're too up. Another guy's like, no, 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 we're too up. We're like, no, we're too up. <laughs> it's like that. That's yeah, what totally, boxing is like. Totally. Boxing is like, like the, it's like five a side football, which is at a low enough level not to merit a referee. It's just frustrating at best. It's totally frustrating mm. at best, you know. I, I totally agree. So that's um, that's what grinds my gear. I thought it was a little bit more reflective this week than mm-hmm. the previous occasions. So I thought. Well, it's because runs. it's because we introduced a new section about Tyson Fury. So yeah, yeah it's kind of. Really it's, it's really been a lifesaver. For <laughs> it's, it's changed my my perception on so many things. <laughs> so Ryan, go on then. What's your grinds my gears? You know what really grinds my gears? So. Uh, what grinds my gears this week is Deontay Wilder. Do tell. Oh, man. So, listeners, if you weren't aware, Deontay Wilder uh, and Anthony Joshua were trying to arrange a fight which would make them the one of them the unified, undisputed heavyweight champion of the world. It would be an ultimate fight. Um, and, you know, since Anthony Joshua beat Joseph Parker... Poor Eddie Hearn has been trying to make this fight happen. (laughs) I think there's a good percentage of people that would probably think you're taking sides just a tiny bit here. (laughs) 
<laughs> look, not that look, not that I am too easy on Eddie Hearn at all, you know, but I do like him and he is he is a hard working man, a beautiful man as well. Um <laughs> but <laughs> um like unfortunately um the WBA called a mandatory fighter in Alexander Povotkin not long after Anthony Joshua beat Joseph Parker. And as we covered last week, this means that Anthony Joshua has to fight him in order to keep his belt from the WBA. Um, so Eddie Hearn and Anthony Joshua's side, they wrote an, an exception to the WBA and said, look, you know, can we work with it? Because we want to try and make this uh, Deontay Wilder fight happen. You know, so can we try and get things sorted? If we m- manage to get Deontay Wilder, can we fight him before we fight Alexander Provokin? And the WBA, like, played ball and they said yes. Now, from what it seems, Eddie Hearn and Anthony Joshua, and they sent over contracts to Deontay Wilder's camp. You know, they offered money that Deontay Wilder's never made in a fight ever before to fight in November in the UK and they properly dragged their heels and uh, Deontay Wilder's promoter came out not long ago and said oh well yeah we've got the contract we've got some comments to send back blah 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 and because it seemed like the deal wasn't going to get done quick enough for the WBA's liking they actually said look you've got 24 hours to to get the deal with Alexander Povotkin or you're going to lose your belt so it, it kind of forced Anthony Joshua's hand on making this. Now Deontay Wilder's coming out saying, you dodged the fight, you did this, you don't want to fight me, you're scared, blah, blah, blah. And it's just ridiculous, actually. Like, Mm. I I think that Deontay Wilder is ill-advised at best. I think he's stupid at worst and ill-advised at best because actually he was getting offered five times more than he'd ever made in any fight ever before Plus, he would if he won and there was a rematch, he'd be the A side, so he'd get like thirty million for the fight, and it would be in the US for the rematch. What mm-hmm. is this guy's problem, Andy? I think it's I think it's a, a reasonable point. I, I, I do, and I think there's a, a something funny going on. There's obviously more to it than, than meets the eye, but one of the things which I don't think is is in dispute is that. They had a contract. There was weeks and weeks of extensions that mm-hmm. the WBA gave while the, these contract negotiations were supposed to get started. And at various points, Wilder and his team have had a contract in front of them with the opportunity to either sign it or to make comments and then return the contract. Mm-hmm. And at the risk of sounding a bit like a, a Billy Big Balls, um, when I'm not doing fabulous podcasts, some of the stuff I've worked on professionally is around contracts. And some of them I have to say were a little bit bigger than this one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the thing is, when you've got the offer of a contract in front of you, then if you've an incentive and you know there's a deadline, this is obvious, but you then you then return it as, as quickly as possible. It doesn't make mm-hmm. any sense. Unless you're wanting to somehow miss a deadline, you wouldn't sit on it for days and days and days. And the contract until it's signed is just like an offer. So you can make whatever the fuck amendments or changes to the contract you want. You can make them to the to the commercial terms. You can make them to the financial terms. You can make them to the operational terms. You can make whatever changes you like to that proposed contract. And then you can fire it back to them and then you go, yo, Eddie, AJ, sign this. And you go, this is my counter proposal. You can make all the amendments you want and there's no penalty for doing that. The only thing that it doesn't make any sense that you do is that you drag your heels and you don't send anything back for days and days and days, which is what they did. But if they wanted to make the fight and they wanted to make it on their own terms, then fine, just send the contract back with the amendments as, a, as another starting point in the negotiation and then it'll go back and forth however many times. But if you know that they're under time pressure, unless you actually don't want it, it doesn't really make sense to sit on it. I totally. Which is what they did. And the, here's the thing, right, as well, is... I'm pretty sure Deontay Wilder has a grasp of the way boxing works with the sanctioning bodies. Uh, He Mm -hmm. must. I would hope so, right? So he must realize that when a mandatory is called, then AJ's hand is kind of forced because of the mandatory. Mm -hmm. So it's not like 
he's necessarily running scared. He's got a choice. Do I lose a belt for the sake of fighting Deontay Wilder, which makes the fight actually not as impressive anymore? Mm -hmm. Or do I hold on to my belt, fight this other guy, and then try and fight him again to fight Deontay Wilder later? So Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't understand. I think Deontay Wilder comes from the kind of Tyson Fury school of negotiations. Because mm-hmm. it's like, why are you just making stuff up that you know isn't right? You know? Yeah, it, it doesn't make sense. Um, and it's interesting, I thought, that the the WBA president apportions blame, really, in terms of his commentary on it. Their statement on it, he apportions the blame more to the Wilder camp. He says, mm-hmm. I understand because Wilder and his team, ha- I'm paraphrasing it, this isn't going. Mm-hmm. Cool. I haven't returned the contract that has been sent to them uh, within this time. We have no option, blah, 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 but to then force the mandatory. So he's basically saying they're sitting on a contract unsigned. Therefore, yeah. you know, it's like they're not they're not doing anything with it. So he's kind of saying that it's Wilder and his team that are more to blame. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think I think it probably is. I mean, look, I'm, I know that I'm, I'm quite sweet on Eddie Hearn a lot, but I don't think that Eddie Hearn who's a very serious businessman is going to mess about with this stuff. He's successful at doing this job because he's good at doing this job and he's good at making fights. You know, the boy's got like, he's got, uh, you know, Cardiff and Wembley on speed dial whenever he wants a fight. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's looking at making big fights. Deontay Wilder's never sold out a stadium as big as... as uh, He's never sold out a stadium, stadium, I don't think, at all. No, Ma- think Madison Square big. Garden is 10,000, and I don't think he even sold that out for the Lewis Ortiz fight. I think it was maybe not even there, Ryan. I think it was maybe in, in the Brooklyn set. I don't know what it's called, but the centre in Brooklyn. That he oh, fought. really? I don't even think it was in right, Madison okay. Square Gardens, because it's maybe not even that prestigious. We can check. Yeah. Next week, correction. Next week, correction. <laughs> um, but yeah, one of the... One of the things that Wilder's team said that the reason that they didn't sign it was because the it was like the date and the venue were mm-hmm. not confirmed at that point. Yeah, but you can you can write into the contract that the the date has to be within this. We'll sign the contract, but the date has to be within this window, which is on the responsibility of um, you know Eddie Hearn's team to confirm. Yeah, and the venue has to be either this or this or this venue within that time frame. If they don't meet. Uh, if they try and propose something counter to that, we either have to agree to it or they pay a penalty of X amount. You you can write all that stuff into a contract. You don't have to have the venue confirmed. You can say it will be this one or else it has to be a mutually agreed one or else you pay a penalty and the yeah. contract is void or whatever. But you can, there are ways all these dozens of lawyers can implement methods or wording in the contract to to kind of to make that a mute point that it's not is that it's not, you know, finalised at the point of the contract being signing. You, you know, or you can say at a venue to be specified, but it must be one of this, this, or this venue. There's all sorts of different ways you can do it. And for them to go, well, that's why we didn't sign the contract, without saying, well, let's, we need to put counter wording in to make it fine for this to then be the case. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? If you want to work, you can arrange the contract in such a way as that that's not uh, like a total roadblock. But that's not obviously what they wanted to do. Uh, of course, they never sent any compact, any con- comments back at all. Because I, you know, I think the problem is that Jonte Wilder has absolutely no understanding of contract law whatsoever. Which I mean, might come as a surprise to you. Prob- <laughs> <laughs> I think it might be getting into. Maybe he could listen to this podcast. I think he probably should, to be honest. Um, you know, but like, I think that's his big problem. Is that you know, I think most of his. Like contracts have been drawn up on the back of a fag packet, and like you know, he that's that you know they're like, all right, Deontay, you're fighting him on this date at that time, and he's like, all right, yeah, I'll go fight him. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think he's as particular about things as like maybe like matchroom boxing make things particular, and you know he's not he's not in super fights. You know he's fighting forty nine year old Luis Ortiz in somebody's back garden for for twelve quid. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's a slight exaggeration. But yeah, I get, yeah. I get the point. But yeah. I mean, his his advisors are like super experienced dealing with big fights, like his um, uh, well, Al Harrington and, and Hyman. Hey, Al Hyman, is that? Yeah, Al Hyman. That's it. Al Hyman yeah. and Shirley Finkel. Winkle. <laughs> Finkel. Yeah. Is it Finkel. Yeah. Anyway, I think fundamentally is there's at least at least one of the parties 
um, don't want the fight to happen now, and the fact mm-hmm. that you sit on a contract for however many days, if you really, really want to make, if you're, if you are desperate for some business, mm-hmm. then you don't sit on a contract for days and days and days because you can get the comments drawn up with like lawyers earning a fortune. You can make comment changes in like a day, and it's just not that difficult because you don't need to rewrite the whole thing. You just make comments and amendments, and you can yeah. do it in a day or whatever. Unless it was incredibly complex, but I really don't think in this occasion it would have been. So. Yeah. I think the fact that they didn't do anything, and now he's come out since saying, oh, by the way, oh, no, they've messed me around. It's 50-50 or nothing. For yeah. me, that's, oh, hold on a minute. Hold on a yeah. minute. You want more money? Exactly. And here's the thing, right? It's unfortunately for Anthony Joshua, Deontay Wilder's got him a bit by the balls because mm-hmm. Anthony Joshua wants all the belts, and Deontay Wilder has one of the belts that he needs. So the only other way around this happening, right, is for Eddie Hearn to get it to the point where Dylan White has to fight Deontay Wilder as a mandatory. Well, which should have had, which actually should be his fight next. Yeah. At least somehow the, the man, there's somehow that workaround where it's Brazil that he's probably going to fight next. Yeah, I don't, exactly. We talked about that last week. It doesn't make sense. No. But, yeah, I mean, there's, that is obviously the other option, is that at some point... Um, because there's been enough examples of it, Wilder will get in a fight that he will lose. I mean, he was he was twenty seconds or ten seconds away from getting beat by Ortiz. He yeah, was on the cusp. Yeah, totally, hundred percent. And um, Luis Ortiz is at least sixty five years old. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's officially thirty eight, but I think there is a very big question mark about his age. I'm pretty sure. Like whenever he gets mentioned, people like I'm pretty sure Eddie Hearn in an interview quite recently was like, nobody actually knows how old that man is. <laughs> Which seems ridiculous, but I think there are definitely question marks. And if you'd seen him in fights like a few years ago, mm-hmm. um, he looks much more devastating than he did recently. And he still was, you know, just it was he just gassed out. He ran mm-hmm. out of puff against mm-hmm. Wilder, or else he would have beaten him. So I think I think Wilder, because of his style, is vulnerable. Like other people have hit him, like Molina um, caught him, and there were a couple other people that I think have had like wobbled him. So I, yeah. mean, I know Joshua got put down by Klitschko, but I think Wilder's more. I think he's probably more vulnerable. I think he's if he keeps fighting top ranked guys, he will eventually get beaten. I think Dylan so, might beat him actually. I think he maybe would beat him. I think, I, I think a lot him. of people will have a strong disagreement with us about that. But I think he'd, he'd at least have a, a reasonable chance because he's yeah. he's sort of fit in game and, and can punch. Yeah. Um, cool. Well, I think that that's enough for me on Deontay Wilder at the moment. Um, but like obviously we'll have to just see what happens with this because like Eddie Hearn has still got a date in April that he's ready to fight um, Deontay Wilder Anthony Joshua Deontay Wilder in Cardiff 28th of April it's there it's penciled in it could happen but I think it just takes like Deontay Wilder to learn to read first I think to be honest I'm sure officially (laughs) we're saying that he can read Officially. Maybe not contracts, but that might be a bit difficult. Yeah. But I'm sure you'll be able to pick out the dates in the contract or whatever. Yeah, exactly. And like, maybe the location. Me, is that me fighting where? What? Okay. <laughs> I think... Do you know what the biggest problem is? I, d- I don't think he realises Cardiff is in the UK. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not fighting in Africa. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I said I'd fight in the UK, not, not in Africa. Where the hell is Cardiff? <laughs> Oh, Only time will tell. Only time will tell. Um, the next little bit I wanted to move into uh, is just some listener appreciation, listener corner. Um, we've got uh, a review on iTunes. Uh, I know, totally. Now listen to this, right? This is absolutely blinding. By a, by a guy named Jimmy Tisler, right? Um, he rated us five stars. I don't think they like boxing much. Funny as fuck, though, right? Uh, And this is what it reads. If you came here to listen about how good boxing is, you'll be disappointed. (laughs) If you came came here to listen to two lads rip boxing to shreds, you're in for a treat. If you don't like Tyson Fury, you'll be in heaven. (laughs) 
Looking forward to Ryan fighting Tyson, uncastrated boar for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, Fury in August. So thank you very much to Jimmy Tisler for our, our great review. Remember, guys, you can go on and rate us five stars as well. Um, I also would like to maybe highlight what I think is probably our most, um, our furthest away listener, which is James Thorne uh, in Abu Dhabi. Wow. Which I think is, I, I think if anybody is from further afield than Abu Dhabi, please give us a shout. That would be good. Um, you know, and uh, uh, just remember to like rate us on five stars. Tell your mates about us. Download it. You know, have your mom listen to it. It would be great. You know. Yeah. Thank you very much to everyone who's taken the the time to listen. I think our. Uh... Am I right in saying that the the listener numbers are 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 creeping up? Maybe we shouldn't go into too much, but I think we are we're building some uh, unmistakable momentum. Here. <laughs> so it is. It's it's been it's been like the last week's been amazing. So thank you everyone who's listened, and please keep listening and share it with people who also don't know anything about boxing. Like, just tell them, like, if they think it's a boxing podcast, it's kind of not. There's yeah. a, there's... See, an interest in boxing is probably not required. <laughs> There will be an increase on Google too, uh, searches of who is Tyson Fury. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank us. you. Cool. Um, so, with that, we'll be back again next week. So, uh, it's goodbye from me, Ryan. And goodbye from me, Andrew. <laughs>